Okay, here I'm going to be going over the top 10 plant problems from the 2019 growing season, even though I'm sure that these have been seen in the past and will very likely be seen also going forward in the future. So when we're talking about disease, we want to first talk about the things that it takes in order to get a disease. We need a pathogen, this could be a bacteria, a fungus, or a virus, a susceptible host, a favorable environment, and time for all these to interact in order to get the disease. So all three or four, if we add time, of these factors must come in contact with one another um, to get a full-blown disease. So counteracting or preventing any one of these will prevent the disease, which might seem like it's really easy, uh, but they can be very common and very quick to spread given the right lineup of conditions. So when we have an issue, we want to classify it. Uh, virus, nutrient, insects, fungi, bacteria, and the grower are all um, main classification areas. With viruses, it's kind of tough in plants because there's not, they're not living and there's really no cure for them. Nutrients, we tend to see um, occurrences happen across a field, and they can have some very characteristic appearances. Insects seem like they can happen overnight, or in other cases, they'll only attack certain varieties we may have in a field. Uh, fungi, that's why we have the fungicides, because uh, it's a major uh, area of problems. Bacteria can be difficult to control, not necessarily super common uh, in the northeast, but certain years they definitely are more common. And then the grower can also be the issue, which can be the hardest one to admit. So if we're looking here, we have blossom end rot in tomatoes, and that's that sunken, darkened region here. It's also occurring on this fruit down here. Now this is a calcium deficiency. So in all these slides, I'm going to occur, um, I'm going to include these resource links. These are also in the description. So if you go down in the description of this video, find the um, links to resources, you'll also find um, these links. And they were all checked as the post the day this video was posted um, to be active. So hopefully they still are when you go to look at them. Again, speaking sp particularly to calcium deficiency, it's a rot spot, rot spot that tends to start towards the blossom end. And um, this can be occurring typically in tomatoes that are longer because that calcium basically runs out before it gets to the end and that's why you get the rotten appearance down here. Um, it can occur um, particularly in high tunnels with a lot of irrigation events uh, because simply we're flushing out and you know, leaching out some of the calcium that might be in the soil. How to prevent it? Well getting a soil test to know if you're low, a uh, tissue test as well, um, and making sure you're fertilizing with calcium, in particular if you're doing a lot of irrigation events in high tunnels, for example. I list two products here and a resource link uh, to give you some more information. Continuing on, we have potassium and magnesium deficiency. Uh, they can occur both in melons and tomatoes. We see a zoomed in version here. Uh, potassium in particular, looking at the margins, and magnesium here on the tomato. So speaking specifically to potassium, okay, uh, what to look for is browning of the leaf margin. So don't just say leaves are browning. If you look particularly at this tomato leaf, uh, this bean leaf here, the margins are what's burning. Uh, if you're growing tomatoes, it can also know sometimes yellow shoulders can be another indication um, of that occurring within uh, tomatoes, particularly again in high tunnels. How to prevent? Well, when you're irrigating, you might want to irrigate with a potassium product, particularly during the plant growth, or at the end of the plant growth, into fruit development phase. Sulfate potassium 0050 is a very potent source, um, so you don't have to use a lot of it to get the necessary amount. Kelp is often touted as being great in potassium, but it may, may, have it, may find it difficult to add the quantities of kelp uh, potassium in kelp that you may need when your plants are going to maximum fruit load and fruit set. And a couple resource links here. Continuing on to magnesium deficiency, again in tomatoes, those lower leaves will start to get this yellow appearance. This intervenal chlorosis is what you're looking for. Typically starts at fruit set, and you want to monitor your plants. Uh, the uh, fix can be actually quite easy. Epsom salts starting at a rate of one tablespoon per gallon, and that can be applied to the leaves and also as a soil drench. Also, if you're using a CalMag product, uh, it can be advised because you're getting the calcium to prevent blossom end rot in tomatoes and also some magnesium. And just keep in mind, down here, we also have some a link to a resource link for you. Continuing on, we have squash bug nymphs. So these are insects, of course, that can occur, and you tend not to find just one of them. You tend to find them in clusters. This is just as they're basically hatching, and this is then a little bit more advanced, but not quite at the adult stage. These two stages are the key points if you want to apply a control product. So our management of squash bugs, well, what to look for, they're these large brown beetles. When they crush them, they smell like sour apple. This one is actively laying eggs here. How to prevent them? Well, insect netting is the only real option. Um, spray products, if you are going to apply them, 
this would be the time to apply them because they're much easier to kill here before they get this kind of armored plating to them. A couple um, control products mentioned here, as well as some resource links. Alternaria or early blight in tomatoes. This is a very classic sign here. Uh, well, there might be a little magnesium deficiency going on. What we're focused on here is this brown region right here. It almost looks like you've cut down a tree. You can kind of see the rings of a tree. This is classic alternaria or early blight. Now, early blight on tomatoes, what you want to look for are small black specks located on the lower leaves. It'll start out as that. Then it will kind of progress to this more brown region that have rings like a tree. You want to limit soil splash and ensure light penetration into the canopy. Again, some control products and some information here provided. Verticillium on cucurbits and eggplant. Uh, so kind of looking at the brown regions, which you might initially get confused, where it looks similar to potassium deficiency. There's some key factors here with verticillium. For verticillium, what you look for is a V burn to the, in the leaf margins is characteristic. So in some cases, verticillium will only affect half of the leaf. If it was potassium, it would be across the whole leaf. Um, very, very common in eggplants, especially if you've been growing in the same area year after year. Uh, in cucurbits, the more of the entire leaf, you don't quite get this dramatic effect. Uh, and how to prevent it is crop rotations and keeping an eye out for it. And when you do see it, no one can need to rotate. Since it's soil-based, there's very little you can do. Um, so that's why that in season, you want to keep those rotations going. And a couple of resource links provided. A resource link provided there at the bottom. Leaf mold on tomatoes. Well, this is what it looks like from the upper portion of the leaf. It looks like from the lower portion of the leaf. Uh, I know I'd make a good hand model sometime. Uh, this is looking at the comparisons of how leaf mold looks at the top and underside of the leaf. So what to look for is those uh, fuzzies, uh, lesions, either on the top or bottom of the leaves, uh, typically in areas that are protected, uh, commonly in high tunnels and shady areas where there can be a lot of moisture um, that's kind of accumulating. This disease can spread very quickly, especially if there's high humidity. So when you first detect it, it's recommended you kind of get a control product applied. Uh, and try to maintain good air circulation with tomatoes that can be through pruning, uh, and, over, and avoid overfeeding plants with nitrogen because that will cause excess foliage and increase the odds of creating those high humidity environments. A couple control products and also some resource links provided. Powdery mildew, um, the effect on this is spray control. So powdery mildew, we try to want to identify at this stage because once we see it at this stage, it can spread very quickly. Uh, this is a little bit more common. Uh, and this is typically what you'll see in the field. However, this leaf is very unique because this grower was actually applying powdery mildew control products. Um, they're like, well, they still have powdery. But if you notice in the center portion of the leaf where that um, liquid is going to accumulate and kind of run down the center stalk here, uh, where that product had the most contact time with the leaf was definitely uh, preventing it from occurring. These upper curled up portions of the leaf, <clears throat> higher odds of getting powdery simply because there's less contact control. Um, so very important to notice that this grower is actively spraying. And they should continue because it is working uh, where it's coming in contact. What to look for? Uh, again, this is kind of that early detection. The earlier you can detect it, the better. You want to look in the shadier regions, the underside of the leaves. This is the top portion of the leaf that was shady. They have to pull down to get in the sun to get the picture. Um, also, when you're looking for powdery, it's actually wise to take your sunglasses off because the polarization of the lenses as you turn your head can actually um, hide some of the smaller um, kind of fungus because it's a 3D, uh, when it, especially when it early um, starts. If possible, you want to select resistant varieties. And there's a whole bunch of organic and chemical options for powdery. A lot of research has been done on it. We have a lot of uh, resource links here. The best organic approach would be 40% milk and 60% water. As long as you apply that at least once a week, that can really slow down the spread of powdery. So two that look very similar are leaf mold and powdery mildew. So this is leaf mold on the underside. This is the upper side where we're seeing these leaf mold regions are here and here. We see the powdery. Powdery tends to have that cleaner, whiter appearance, while leaf mold that more brownish kind of lesions. Um, uh, leaf mold compared to powdery, what to look for, again, that left image, those white spots are the powdery, and the yellow spots are the leaf mold, and here on the right image we're seeing that same thing. The white spots seem non-existent. In this case, powdery is occurring at the top of the leaf, the lower portions here are the brown. How to prevent, there's many different options, so you might want to have something on hand, because once you see this, you want to be able to get out and spray to control it to slow down its spread. Getting on to bacterial leaf spot, tomatoes and peppers, uh, this is pepper plants, tomato, this is characteristic of bacteria leaf spot. Uh, this is also a uh, bacteria leaf spot. This is what it looks like on a larger scale. It starts as a small little dark specks that are typically circular. 
uh, can be seen on both the leaves and the fruits. That's another concern for retail sale. It can be varied by the cultivar. Uh, how you want to prevent it is trying to reduce soil splash, which this grower did here by putting the um, mulch down. But we could see it was a very wet year and it tends to affect that lower region first and was spreading uh, down the whole row and also up the plant. Uh, fungicides will not work, so you want to use a bacterial side. Um, copper or oxidate or coside um, are um, recommended options that fall under this classification. Check your local laws for what can be used. And here's a couple of resource links to help learn a little bit more if you identify bacterial spec. Yellow vine decline, YVD. Uh, it's just kind of yellowing to the leaves. It's not necessarily the vines that yellow, so it's kind of misleading, but we kind of get this limey green appearance, and it can start as a single plant and spread to other plants. So it's becoming a bigger issue that is kind of getting misdiagnosed. It tends to come in, at least I'm noticing, a little more common in southern New England at times of high heat. So it's getting misdiagnosed as heat stress, simply because it will cause the um, actual fruit, in this case squash, to abort which typically when we get high heat, that can happen. But yellow vine declines a little bit more serious than that because those plants will continue to abort even after um, the temperatures may cool down after a recent heat wave. How to control this? Well, there's nearly nothing you can do because it is a bacteria. You have to control the squash bugs because they are the vector. So preventing or controlling squash bugs will prevent and control yellow vine decline. And using insect netting would be the best option. Something that needs to get a little bit more attention because I think it's, again, getting misdiagnosed uh, and it's happening in more fields than we may originally think at, up to this point in time. Lastly, getting the, the last of the top 10, I know I didn't order them, didn't number them, there's really no exact order, is grower errors. Um, with the advantage of high tunnels or even field growing, we want to make sure we're keeping everything nice, neat, organized, uh, clean, and easy to spot potential errors that may be occurring. Um, having irrigation set up, uh, having things pruned correctly, getting ready for the harvest, and being able to walk down, being able to see down the row. Uh, these are all key things that a grower can be doing correctly, of course, in the ideal situation. Now, the season extension, particularly, talking particularly to high tunnels, uh, you want to be sure at the end of the season you are cleaning them. Uh, it's, issues can occur, usually not just one plant, it'll occur across the entire tunnel. Uh, so you want to be taking the time to scout these uh, and document your practices. So if you do something right or good, you're able to document that and repeat that. If something doesn't go right, you can kind of go back and see what you may have done wrong. Uh, how to control it? Well, it's a kind of a self-reflection. Kind of hope you don't get to the end of the year. We have, you know, swear darts pulling up a lot of money. Uh, you're able to kind of prevent uh, problems. Keeping the structures clean is a great way. This can often be overlooked, especially in the busyness of the season. And you want to reduce the potential for disease carryover into next season. And insect netting would be a great thing to add to your high tunnels, both the vents and doorways. So you limit also local pest pressure because you're creating a nice warm environment. Uh, so just be mindful of document what you need, um, what you're doing, so that it can be repeated in the case of a good season. So hopefully this was uh, helpful on the top 10 plant growing problems for 2019 season. And if you've seen some problems you've had in the past or going forward, this is helpful. Uh, that would be hopefully um, these links and gets you ahead to at least identify what issue you may be having so you can help control it to reduce the reoccurrence or the spreading of the issue.